Like all good stories, this one begins with Once upon a time, before the oceans and land and creatures that dwell within began to get sick, there was a young girl with a beautiful voice. Not that many knew it. When she would wake up in the morning, her mother would ask her to fetch berries in the spring, flowers and roots in the summer, nuts and seeds in the fall, and small furry animals from the traps in the winter. When one season would begin to move into another, her aunties would ask her to help roll up the hides, pack up the sacks for their people, and help walk to the spring fishing grounds, or the summer rusting grounds, or the fall gathering grounds where they would get ready for the cold winters. Always there were caves to rest her body in, food to gather with her hands and put in her mouth, and dirt beneath her feet. The sky stretched over her head, and other times the sky was blocked by the leaves on the trees. The sun would come up and her aunties and her mother would ask her to fetch things for them, or the older kids would ask her to help carry water, or the younger children would ask her to carry them and rock them to sleep. At the end of the day, the fires would be lit, the sun would go down, and the children of all ages would tumble in a heap to listen to stories by the fire their bright eyes slowly overcome by heavy eyelids until they fell into a deep sleep. And life was good. Some years, the rains caused floods and the children would stay closer to the adults. Other years, the rains didn't come on time and their people would walk further to different resting grounds. Frequently, when the rains were late, the babies born would see four winters before they made it back to the young girl's favorite grounds where the land would sing to her. And this is how she learned to measure the passage of time as winter turned into spring, turned into summer, turned into fall, and turned into winter again. Most winters were spent in the caves with the red hands, but twice in her life they spent the winter where there were no caves and not much snow. Those were hard winters followed by harder springs, hotter summers, and not all of the children who started the trek from the springlands would make it home to the cave the following winter. Life was not easy, yet it was all the more sweet for the rewards of berries shared, fish smoked, and stories told. Summers with good rains were long days shared with other people like her people. There would be so much food gathered and dancing and music and storytelling and matchmaking the mothers and the aunties would joke and tell stories and teach the young girls how to take care of their people, how to know which berries treated the winter cold that settled in the chest, and which berries shouldn't be eaten but could be used to dye leather or save to paint the walls of the cave. They taught the children where to ask the river bank for the white mud and which rocks to ask the earth for to make the fires. Always, there were new things to learn, new things to see, new things to experience, and the young girl was happy. One summer, when the young girl was not yet a woman, all the children who had seen the same winters and the same travels were sent to live with the grandmothers for the summer. The grandmothers told embarrassing jokes, cackled loudly if any of the children blushed, 
and taught the children what it meant to become an adult. Most of the children had already learned how to collect food and prepare food, how to thank the plants and animals they lived with, how to walk gently across the grasses and leave no trace. But not all of the children about to become women had learned those things from their mothers, and not all of the children about to become men had learned when to be gentle and when to be strong, when to protect and when to step back. So the grandmothers had a very busy summer. The grandmothers taught why we respect the earth and all of her children. The furred, finned, feathered, and all who flew in the sky, ran over the ground, or swam beneath the water. The grandmothers taught that to live well and live happy meant walking gently on the earth and not harming her. It meant treasuring the water and not wasting her. It meant asking first and never taking more than one needed. As the summer days began to grow shorter and the nights began to grow cooler, the grandmothers told more stories around the fires at night. They told the story of the great hungry ghost which was never satisfied how it would make promises it could never keep, never doing today what it could put off until tomorrow, and always, always, always had the rumbling, growling sounds in the stomach that only happened in years with no rains and not enough food. The grandmothers explained the great hungry ghost was always starving, asking for more than it needed, always eating so its stomach was always growing and therefore never full. As the grandmothers would tell this story of the hungry ghost, how it never thought of the community, only itself, one of the grandmothers would silently work her way around the circle of children, carefully hiding herself in the dark, and pinch any who fell asleep or dozed off. Whichever child had the misfortune of being too tired for story time would jump awake with a shout, and the grandmothers would tell them to pay attention to make sure the hungry ghost never ate them. That the secret to never falling prey to the hungry ghost was to listen to the earth and take care of her always. She has made sure we had shelter. She has always provided us with food. She is like a great mother who makes sure all of her children have what they need. Take care of her, never harm her, and she will take care of us in return. She will never turn her back on us as long as we do not forget to listen to her. She has three rules we must never break, intoned the oldest grandmother in a gravelly voice. We must never abandon our fire to burn her or her children, for that is a wasteful death. We must never take more than we need from her or from any of her children because that leads to imbalance. And, most importantly, we must never dig into her rich brown skin to take anything from her she does not willingly and freely give. That is a violation of her being and would do the greatest harm. And so, the summer went with all the children learning which seeds are good to eat, which are best to keep in a leather pouch to cast upon the earth in the spring, which are best to share with the birds in the air, and which are best offered to the small furry animals that lived in holes in earth's skin. At the end of the summer, the adults returned with meat that had been dried or smoked, Giant hides stretched between long bones they drug behind them, and much laughter to carry them on the long walk to the fall and overwintering grounds. 
the hunts had yielded so much meat, two family groups would be going to the same caves to pass the winter, as the grandmother said the winter would be a long one, and more hands would keep the fires going and make the work lighter. They said the snows would be deep and cover the yearling trees, and all the meat would be gone by the time the last snows melted, but the berries near the caves would be ready before the snows were all gone. They said it would be the perfect season to get the children ready for their coming of age, the time when children became adults and began to enjoy adult privileges like sitting on council and adult responsibilities like caring and planning for future generations, as well as adult choices like whether to stay with their mother's people or extend their journeys to travel with a different group of people. The elders of the people would offer each child a choice of which people to travel with and call family. They would also help each child identify which gift they would share with the people that summer when all the family groups came together for the coming of age celebration. The young girl was good at following the directions of her mama and the aunties. She was good at anticipating what the grandmothers needed. She was even good with the younger children who still had four or more years before their own coming of age. But she worried what her gift would be over the summer because she had no special gift. She was good with her sling, but didn't have enough power yet in her arm to bring down something big enough to feed the whole camp. She was good at collecting the berries to make both the red and the blue dye, but she didn't have her mother's patience to dry and grind the berries into anything useful. And she didn't tolerate the berries to even work with the dye. They made her skin itch and her eyes water. She couldn't always identify the plants well enough to safely separate the medicines from the poisons like her mama's brother could. And she didn't have her older sister's gift to whisper the fish into the shallows to catch. What could she offer as her gift? She wasn't very special. Just average. Just good enough at everything she did. Over the winter, she spent all her free time with the grandmothers, trying to learn about a new gift, a special gift. Maybe there was something she didn't know about that she could offer to the people. If she could just learn what the, the something was from the grandmothers. At night, as the other children would fall asleep, the young girl would remember the trick from the grandmothers the summer before and would pinch herself so she could stay awake and listen to more stories. But all the stories were stories she had heard before. Stories that taught why the sun and the moon shared the sky for the health of all of Earth's children. Stories about why the creatures of the deep water must be treated with respect and sung to so they don't feel forgotten. And her favorite stories about taking care of the earth's deep, dark, rich brown skin so food would return every spring. Winter passed, and all the children helped tell the new stories of the past four summers on the walls of the cave, adding their growing hands to the red outlines of their hands and their older sibling hands from all the years before. Some of the children talked about being invited to stay at the caves all year long to help with the stories. As spring came, the children followed the bidding of the grandmothers and swept and cleaned and dug pits for cooking and for refuse. Urine was collected to be aged to clean and cure the hides. Hides were stretched and scraped. There was so much activity, the young girl no longer had time to be worried about her gift, 
for she was asked to do chores before she was even out of bed and was so exhausted before the stews were ready when the sun finally went down she didn't even have enough energy to pinch her thighs to stay awake and listen to the stories at night. The snows melted and the berries were replaced with freshly caught fish and roots to eat. The last of the dried meat from the year before was finished as the first catch of fish was brought up from the river. The people who traveled mostly along the deep salty waters started arriving and setting up their shelters and offering to trade their pouches of salt to rub in the meat. The seeds were collected from the red and orange flowers that were used to flavor foods and also as medicine. Everywhere there was activity and people. Never in her memory had the young girl remembered being around so many of the people at once. Laughing and singing, games and dancing, wrestling and weaving, it was almost overwhelming. As more groups arrived and more people the young girl had never met before settled in for the summer, the anxiety over what gifts she would offer for her coming of age began to creep back up. But before it could become overwhelming, exhaustion would take over. And then, a new day would begin with new novelties. Before the shadows completely disappeared at midday, the grandmothers announced it was time. All the children between 10 winters and 16 winters were to pack their night walking clothes, a knife, and their personal stone, plus the pouch given to them by their mother and or their sponsor. <gasps> the young girl looked up in surprise. She had no sponsor. She had been so busy fetching and helping all winter and spring and listening to the stories of the grandmothers, she hadn't developed a relationship with a specific sponsor. She had been too worried about her gift. She had forgotten to ask any of her mother's people to sponsor her. Embarrassed over her failure, she packed up her night walking clothes, her knife, and asked her circle of stones at the head of her sleeping furs which one would come with her. Her white and purple stone with its round base and sharp points fell over with a question, so the points were left reaching for the young girl. She respectfully wrapped it in her clothes and went in search of her mother. She found her mother with a circle of women who all worked with dyes, laughing and trading stories about the different colors they could get from an animal in the deep water if they were lucky enough to have the deep water gift them with the animal. Her mother saw her coming and reached inside her covering to lift out a pouch on a red dyed leather thong and carefully placed it around her daughter's neck. I dreamed of this moment and I believe you will find everything you need inside. If you feel your tummy getting tight, or your voice starts to crack, remember to unwrap your feet and put them in the dirt. When your toes can wiggle and the skin of the earth can wrap around your toes, you should find your voice again. With that, her mother placed both hands on her shoulders and pulled her down so they could rub their noses as they had since she was little. Then her mother gave her a little push in the direction of the other children and returned to her discussion and laughter over how to get the dye to make the leather look like fresh blood. The young girl picked up her satchel and ran to the meadow where the other children were already gathered around all of the grandmothers. In the very center, sitting on a rock that looked like an upright tree log, sat a grandmother the young girl had never seen before. The grandmother was running her fingers through her hair, and her hair was so long. The grandmothers the young girl had grown up with had long, thick silver hair that draped over their feet when they let down their hair. 
this grandmother was sitting on the rock, a rock taller than the girl was tall. Everyone had to strain their neck to look up at the grandmother if they got too close to the tree rock itself. Yet, as high off the ground as she was, her thick silver hair draped over her shoulders like a blanket, covering the tree rock below her and reaching all the way down to the ground. The rest of the grandmother separated the children out based on the color of the leather pouches they had around their necks. Three grandmothers tended to a cook fire and served food up to each group of children before directing them back to their area to eat. As the grandmother on the tree rock finished finger combing her hair and the last group of children settled into their seats with their food, a quiet, full of anticipation, descended as the sun set over the horizon. Tonight will be the last time you hear story as a child, intoned the grandmother now standing on the tree rock in the center. Her voice was deep and rich and quietly commanded anyone who heard it to pay attention. Tonight is the last night you will sleep together as children. Tomorrow, when the sun rises, you will follow the leading of your dreams and will stay away from the other children. You will eat nothing until you return to us and we feed you as new adults. You will drink nothing except the bag of drink we give you. You will not return until your bag is empty and you have made room for the adult you need to be. With that, all the children looked at one another with wide eyes as the grandmothers began the story fire at the feet of the grandmother on the tree stone. The children finished eating as the grandmother told the story of the siblings' sun and moon and how they chose to share the sky rather than fight and destroy harmony. As she finished her story, the grandmother's voice changed and the young girl realized a different grandmother was now atop the tree stone in the center. This grandmother was telling the story of Brother Deer and Sister Bison and the importance of caring for the next generation. The voice changed yet again, and the young girl realized that the long silver hair looked like a cloud reflecting the firelight, while also hiding the movement of the grandmother's changing places on the tree stone. Looking around, she realized she was the only one seated in her area and there was only one pile of sleeping furs. She was alone. No one else had been seated with her. She felt a tear tremble on her cheek and covered up wiping it away by spreading out her sleeping furs as the temperature began to drop. As she listened to the story of the two creatures who loved to run under the sun, who ran for the sheer joy of running and the joy of running together, she looked around at the clearing they were in. The tree stone in the center was at the bottom of a natural depression, a depression shaped like a bowl in the earth. As she rubbed the dirt between her fingers, she realized the bowl would fill up with water in the hard rains, as this dirt didn't have much sandy grit to facilitate good drainage. This dirt was smooth, almost soft, like the dirt they mixed with water to shape the cooking bowls that stayed at the caves when they traveled. The grandmothers fed the story fire, so shadows danced around the rock. It looked like the fire went all the way around the tree rock. So, how did the grandmothers keep changing who was telling story? The 
next voice was the grandmother the young girl had enjoyed helping the most over the past year. The voice was melodic and soft, and as the grandmother told the girl's favorite story about caring for the skin of the land, the same way they cared for the skin of the grandmothers to ensure more food at the end of winter, and the young girl drifted off to sleep. In her dream, clouds drifted into the bowl and hid everyone from view. The stories came from voices that were no longer attached to people, silver-tongued words floating on air. A gentle breeze swirled the clouds and shapes emerged. First, she watched beetles rolling a ball along the ground in semi-darkness. As more light reached the rolling ball, she realized they only had two legs, not six. The people were rolling something out of a deep cave up toward the sunlight. As sunlight touched the big rock they were rolling out of the cave, the rock glittered brightly in the light. And as the sun glitters off the deep water, so too did the sun glitter off the rock. As the waiting people looked upon the rock with hunger, a child's voice was heard sounding an alarm in the distance about the deep water turning into a mountain. None of the people she was watching turned to see what the child's voice was saying. The clouds swirled again. And she was looking out over where the deep water normally washed back and forth against the shore. She could see out past where the children would swim to bring up the mussels that were good and stew. She could see the deep water had receded so far out she couldn't see it any longer. She could only see sand and shells and flopping fish where she and the other children could easily walk out to gather them. But she didn't feel hunger in her dream. She felt fear of where the water had gone. With another swirl of clouds in her dream, she watched people with sharp sticks cut deep gashes into the skin of the land. Some people put seeds in the gashes they cut. Others pulled things out of the gashes. She watched the clouds swirl into growing plants and growing communities that didn't move every season. She watched trees cut down and burned or stacked together to make caves out of trees. Always there were more people and more people. She watched the sun rise and the sun set faster and faster in her dream. She watched the last sunset turn into a fire that burnt the caves made out of trees. When the fire was over and everything was burned black, she saw the deep gashes were bleeding and the burnt bones of the people scattered across the land. As the clouds swirled again and the young girl began to prepare herself for her next dream vision, she was shaken awake by the firm grip of a leathery hand. The grandmother, who had first been on the tree stone, put her finger to her lip, indicating she should remain silent. She hurriedly changed into her night walking clothes as indicated, and left behind her childhood clothes on top of the sleeping furs. The grandmother and the young girl walked up the rest of the hill and looked down on all the sleeping children spread out in groups around the tree stone. Small wisps of clouds passed from one sleeping group of children to another, gently sliding across their brows as they slept. The young girl noticed even the grandmother slept. Seven slept in a ring around the carefully banked story fires. The rest slept along the top of the embankment that surrounded the bowl with their feet down toward the tree stone 
and their heads looking like silhouettes of round stones along the top of the hill as light just began to tinge the sky. The young girl could finally see that each of the seven fires around the tree stone were separated by a narrow path of dirt, or maybe stone logs, burnt black from the fires. These seven paths joined the dirt around the tree rock to the depression the children were sleeping in, while remaining indistinguishable from the land when the fires were not burning. As she puzzled over how deep the fire pits must be to burn rocks and stones so black, she felt the grandmother's hand on her shoulder. Their eyes met, and as one, they began to walk to the east to meet the rising sun. And that, dear souls, is the end of the beginning of our story.